How you doing out there, everybody? I'm Scott Mouts. I'm uh, so thrilled to be with you to be able to share today's webinar. The topic is leading from the middle, a playbook for managers to lead, influence up, down, and across the organization. Just a little bit about me, very, very quickly. I'm Scott Mouts. I'm an author, trainer, and speaker. I'm also blessed enough to have been a, a former senior executive at Procter & Gamble, where I was lucky enough to run some of the company's very largest multi-billion dollar businesses. I also am executive, I'm in the executive education department at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business. I'm faculty there. And maybe most importantly for this webinar is for you to understand that I've been studying middle managers for over two decades and have learned a ton about what makes for the best middle managers and the ones that aren't so great and what the unique challenges are that they face. All of that has led into uh, a book that comes out May 18th and has already seen a lot of accolades. It's already a hit number one on Amazon as a best-selling new release in management science. I'm very proud of that, but I, but I think it speaks more to the unmet need that we have with middle managers. Most books talk about you know, CEOs at the top level or they talk about you know, getting off to a fast start in your company and that big middle is left out and this book is kind of a love letter to those people. So let's dive right in. Well, first of all, who qualifies as a middle manager, right? So I talk about, you know, middle management. What, well, what does that really mean? Well, here's what it means. A middle manager is anyone who has a boss and is a boss and as part of their job has to lead up, down, and across the organization to influence, to do their job effectively. So sometimes people think like, well, you know, maybe I'm not really a middle manager. I'm too high in the company or I'm too low in the company. No, no, no. There's such things as upper middle, mid middle, and lower middle management in any level in the organization. If you have a boss and are a boss, or even if you're not a boss yet, but you want to get there soon, a lot of what I'm going to teach today will help you get there sooner than before you know it by pure definition terms, you're a middle manager. So that's who a middle manager is. And why are they so important? You know, why have I chosen to write this love letter to them and to focus on them? Well, to figure that out, here's just a couple of numbers to kind of set the stage for you. Let's focus on the number 25% first. Believe it or not, we now know through research that middle managers make up more than 25% of the variance in revenue at a company. That's three times more than any individual person responsible for innovation in a company. Here's another number, number for you. We know that middle managers, one middle manager by him or herself can reduce turnover in a company by more than 20%. Just that person alone, they're the key to employee engagement, which makes sense when you think about it. They're in the middle. They have the most influence and most contact with everybody up, down, and across the organization. One last number for you, five. A Stanford study that took five years to complete, incredibly thorough, showed that, hold on your hats for this. If you take a poor middle manager and replace them with even an average middle manager, just once, just one poor middle manager with one average middle manager, it is more productive and efficient than adding an entire net new body to an organization. That's how important middle managers are and why I've written this love letter in the form of the book leading from the middle from them. So, okay, so you now understand that you're a middle manager. You know why you're so important. You know, you understand you're the backbone of any organization, any organization. So how do you excel at being a middle manager? Well, as it turns out, there's very unique differences and very unique problems that middle managers face. I spent research, uh, you know, geez, years and years and years of research on over 3,000 different successful middle managers and some not so successful to discern, well, what makes their job so difficult? What is it about that? And what most of them told me in some way, shape, or, or form, it had to do with the scope of their jobs, the broad scope of what their job entailed. And in fact, within that scope, I could share an acronym, you know, which, by the way, this is just my way of saying, don't forget to take pride in your role as a middle manager, right? Because of all of that we talked about. But when you think about the scope of middle managers, there's also an acronym that I could share with you to help categorize for you exactly why middle managers have it so difficult, what's so tough about their job. It's the broad scope of their work, but also the acronym scope, because there within lies five unique challenges of the middle manager. Let's walk through each one. They form the acronym scope, and this explains why it's so difficult for middle managers to handle what I call the messy middle. The first unique challenge is a self-identity problem. 
And we'll come back to talk each one of these. The next is a problem of conflict that middle managers face. The next is a problem of omnipotence, which begs explanation. Issues of physical basis and issues of emotional basis, S-C-O-P-E, the five categories of problems that uniquely middle managers face. Let's talk about each one now. Let's start with self-identity. And this is really, really interesting. You see, when you're a middle manager, you have to wear many, many hats. That's the nature of the job. You have many different roles within an organization. And most middle managers mistakenly believe that the reason why the job is so exhausting is because of the amount of work all these hats that they have to wear creates. And while that's true, that adds to the exhaustion. What research is now showing us is that what's really going on, the reason why you're really so tired, and it might be surprising as a middle manager, is what's known as a self-identity problem, meaning all the hats that you have to wear, that creates and forces you to do what, are, what psychologists call micro transitions, meaning you have to switch from one hat to the other from high power roles to low power roles throughout the day. For example, in, you might have to switch from uh, being in a very deferential stance to your boss. Immediately, you switch to an assertive stance with your employees and then to a collaborative stance with your peers or your teammates. Sometimes it happens all within the same meeting. The constant switching from high power roles to low power roles is exhausting. And sometimes you have to jump into roles you weren't prepared to play. Maybe that's happened to you. You've been in a meeting and maybe a boss pops into the meeting and all of a sudden you have to go into, you know, oh, my boss is in, you know, in the room mode, deferential mode, and, and then try to work all that out within one meeting. Well, well, science is now showing us that is exhausting. And it leaves you wondering, well, what's really my role? You know, what's really my role in the organization? Because I wear so many hats and I'm always switching between them and it's exhausting. The next unique problem is a problem of conflict. Middle managers uniquely, because of the nature that they have to lead up, down, and across, they face conflicting agendas, conflicts of interest, interpersonal conflicts. You name it, conflict is all around them. It's part of the role. A unique problem is also omnipotence, meaning middle managers are expected to know everything. And if you think about it, like what do you think of like the senior suite in an organization? The most senior people in an organization, well, they're not expected to know everything. That's why they have people like you, right? And then new hires in the organization, they're not expected to know everything because they're too new. But for the folks in the middle that have a boss and are a boss, that have to lead up, down, and across, sometimes the feeling is like you're expected to know everything. Your market share ticked down in Peoria, you better know why. And even whether it's not really true that people aren't really expecting that of you, what we now know is that middle managers often tend to put that burden on themselves, feeling like they have to be omnipotent, know everything in their role. All of this adds up to a lot of stress, of course, for the middle manager, which creates physical problems, right? We, we now know that when you take a profile, the health profiles of anybody in the organization, the people that tend to be the least healthy, it's actually not the senior managers, it's the people in the middle. And that also leads to related emotional problems. Because guess what? When you lead from the middle, it can be lonely. You're not really part of anyone's group, right? It's hard to really truly be friends with your boss. It's hard to be you know, friends with your employees, you got to draw the line somewhere. It takes an emotional toll. And in fact, we now know from research that the bottom 5% in any organization, the bottom 5% in terms of unhappiness and unfulfilled, it's actually not employees that are doing poorly, that have terrible performance ratings. And it's not employees. Sometimes people think, well, it's got to be people that are just put into their job, right? They're new in their role and they realize, I'm a terrible fit for this role. Oh my God, I feel like a fraud, right? It's not those people either. The bottom 5% in any organization in terms of unhappiness and unfulfillment are actually people with good performance ratings. They just happen to be people of about, on average, five to 10 years in tenure that have to lead up, down, and across the organization. In other words, middle managers. So this is the scope of unique problems that middle managers face. How do you attack them? What do you do with the scope of problems? Well, here's something that I can offer to you that I found very, very powerful. In the book, Leading from the Middle, I get into very specific solves for each one of these, self-identity, conflict, omnipotence, et cetera. I want to step back from the 10,000-foot view for a second and tell you about something I learned in my research. I found that across over the 3,000 successful middle managers that were part of my research, I discovered that the best of the best they all had a very common theme, which was they were able to mentally reframe the way they viewed their role as a, middle, as a middle manager that addressed all of the problems you see on your screen. 
Let me give you a, a, some examples of the most powerful mental reframes I heard from successful middle managers. First of all, the most successful middle manager said, this first picture here, that they don't see their job as a hundred different jobs that makes them impossible to switch back and forth. They see all those hundred hats they have to wear as an integrated part of the whole one job made up of a hundred different jobs that they are uniquely suited to deliver on. It helps them to take pride in that role, as I was saying earlier. Here's another powerful mental reframe that I heard from a really actually outstanding successful middle manager in Minnesota. And I heard it and I wrote it down and it encapsulates what I heard from the spirit of what I heard from a lot of other successful middle managers. Get ready for this one. We're talking about this picture here. One of the managers said, well, you know, I think of my job as, is this. My job is to think like an engineer, feel like an artist. And I heard that and I thought, wow, that is exactly how the best middle managers think about their roles. They have to think like an engineer. They have to think process-wise with discipline, systematically, get things done, have a plan. At the same time, they have to feel like an artist with empathy, because people are surrounding them everywhere. People come to middle managers all the time to solve their problems, to get help. Think like an engineer, feel like an artist. Here's another brilliant reframe I heard from several middle managers. And, and, and it was, you know, not every, not every one of them said this exactly the same way, but here was the spirit of it, which is the middle manager's job is to be the keeper of the long-term flame and the short-term flame on the business. Their job is to focus and work on the business and in the business. This duality is a treat. It's a privilege that only middle managers can engage in. And one last mental reframe that I heard from more than one middle manager was that they view their job as a lighthouse, a beacon. They're to shine the light, to, to draw everyone towards opportunities in the organization and signal threats to everyone in the organization as well. So very powerful reframes to think of as a middle manager. What I want to dig into now are some best practices. So, okay, so we've identified you're a middle manager. You know why you're the backbone of the organization and why you're so important. You understand the nature of the problems through the acronym SCOPE. We just talked about some mental free reframes in general that you can use to think about your job differently for inspiration. Let's talk about a few best practices of the very best successful middle managers that I encountered in my research and through my over two decades of, of research and experience in this field. And then I'll go into kind of one best piece of advice for managing up, down, and across the organization. A couple of best practice tips for middle managers. The first one is to practice the 50-50 rule. Here's what it says. Now, as middle managers, of course, you're overwhelmed. There's a lot going on. We know that. Coming from every angle, you always have to reprioritize and figure out what's going on. And it's, sometimes it can get overwhelming. And in the moments when things feel most overwhelming, this is when you practice the 50-50 rule, which says spend 50% of your time on pragmatism and 50% of your time on possibilities. First, the pragmatism. 50% of your time on pragmatism. This is also known uh, in some circles as the 2P rule, by the way, for pragmatism and possibility. 50% of your time on pragmatism means, okay, look, I got to be pragmatic here that there's only so much I can get accomplished. With half of my time, I have to force myself to prioritize, to pick what's most important to focus on in what order, what's most crucial. Not everyone else's urgent is my urgent. I have to figure out what's most important to deliver on my objectives, that's pragmatism. The other 50% is spent on seeing possibilities in front of you, the opportunities to progress your business and your personal growth and all the things that you want out of work and in life. And what we know from research is what happens to us, especially in the middle, is when things get so busy and we're so frantic, we get focused on sometimes the pragmatic part. We don't even do that well at that. We'll bounce from fire drill to fire drill, trying to cross things off our to-do list, getting everyone else's urgent thrust in our face, just trying to survive. And we miss all the opportunities in front of us and the possibilities to grow the business, to do things better, better, uh, you know, better faster, higher, farther. And if you have this 50-50 mindset, you're forcing yourself to spend time literally looking for the opportunities in the business, just not just way for ways to survive. A very powerful rule to use when you feel most overwhelmed as a middle manager. Let's talk about another best practice. This is what I call the golden question. And this is thematic amongst many 
of middle managers that I talk to is that in one way, shape or form, they periodically ask themselves this question, am I assisting success or avoiding failure as a middle manager? You see, depending on how you answer this question, they create two very different behaviors. If you ask yourself this question, if, if you're truly assisting success, this is how you're showing up. You're helping employees knock down barriers. You're seeing around corners for them, anticipating and, and seeing in the future to, to help them overcome problems that are going to arise. You're coaching, you're teaching, you're training, you're lining up resources, you're becoming a champion of projects. That's assisting success. But if you're avoiding failure as a middle manager, it's a very different set of behaviors you're showing. You're engaged in micromanagement. And believe me, micromanagement crushes souls, not goals, right? Because you're unconfident or you, you lack confidence in the organization to get it done. So you get involved and you, you over control. You know, micromanagement is good for nobody. If you're avoiding failure, you're engaged in perfectionism. You're being too conservative. You're indecisive. You don't take any smart risks because you don't want to come across wrong. You don't want to, you're afraid of failing. So it's a very powerful question to ask yourself as a middle manager from time to time, am I assisting success or avoiding failure? It's kind of a checkpoint on yourself and your own behaviors. One more powerful best practice that I want to share, and I could do this all day because again, my book uh, Leading from the Middle is, is packed with them. I'm just picking out a few. This one's really important. Middle managers especially, they're at the intersection of the horizontal and vertical flow of information in a company. And it's so important to view information sharing, the act of information sharing as an investment not an intrusion. Here's what I mean by that. A lot, you know, sometimes your employees, they just need to have the information that you have. It doesn't help to withhold it. That helps nobody, right? And sometimes, you know, what, we, what I've learned that middle managers that don't do as well, they're not as successful. They view that as, look, I don't have time to do all the work that's involved in sharing information. It'll get taken wrong. The information I share will get taken out of context. It takes a lot of work to communicate it, communicate it well over and over again, communicate information in a way that it's, that it's useful to the employees. But the best successful middle managers view that time as critical, as an investment. Because you're at that centerpiece of the vertical and horizontal flow of information, it is up to you to be the hub to invest the time it takes to distribute information properly with context through well-written emails, through town hall meetings, through communications over and over again, where, where it's a big part of your, your job. A former Procter & Gamble CEO once told me that 90% of his job was communication. And most of that job was sharing information repeatedly over and over and over again. So seeing information sharing is an investment, not an intrusion on your time. It's critical. That's what some of the best middle managers do. So there's a couple of best practices. Now what I want to do is I want to give you a kind of a power tip for managing up, down, and across. Right? When I say managing up in the organization, what I mean here is as a middle manager, you have to be effective at leading your boss and maybe even your boss's boss, influencing up the food chain with them. Critical part of being a middle manager, right? And it's very difficult for many of us. And I go in depth in this in the, in the book, Leading from the Middle, but I want to give you one power tip, one power piece of advice for leading up, which is to, if you want to lead your boss effectively, you have to understand the asks. You have to be clear on what your boss is asking from you. What are they expecting from you? Getting crystal clear on expectations. Check this out. We're now up to almost, we've been studying almost 300 pairs of, sub, of boss, bosses and subordinates in right 300 different relationships. And in almost 80%, actually it's, to be fair, it's 81% of those boss subordinate relationships, we've seen material breaches in basic understanding of expectations, of what the boss was expecting from the employee, and quite often the other way around too. We know Gallup has added their own set of data to this. They've shown that 50% of employees really have no idea at all of what's expected of them at work. So don't assume that your employees are as clear on expectations as you think they are. I guarantee you the odds are they probably aren't. So what do you do about that? You can't manage your boss effectively until you know you're crystal clear on what's expected of you. So what you can do as an employee or as a boss and, and start this process with your employee, you can employ the good to great grid. 
it's based on a very powerful insight, which says that people often don't do their best work. They don't do their great work because they simply don't know what great looks like. Here's how this tool works. It's very, very powerful. This is a sample good to great grid. Right. Let's say in your company, I put a couple of uh, metrics that might be important in your company on the left side of the grid. Leadership, risk taking, priority setting. Here's how it works. If you're the employee, sit down with your boss. If you're the boss, sit down with your employee. And both of you together, literally put down, like write down in words on this grid, what the definition is of good for each metric and what the defini definition is for great for each metric. Let me give you an example. So priority setting. This is a real example from a team that I used to work with. We sat down and decided good priority setting was trash compactor management. Trash compactor, it's a machine that takes uh, trash and it squishes it down into small cubes, right? Which is good. And if you thought of your work like that, that would be pretty good. A lot of people can't say no. They can't squish their workload down to make it smaller. They're not even good at that. So just the ability to prioritize and eliminate some things to a smaller workload, well, that's good. But we decided great priority setting was accordion management. Accordion is a musical instrument, of course, that you play like this, right? You go in and out. What if you thought about workload like that, that it was flexible and fluid, that you were continually reprioritizing your work, squishing down what you did, and then adding work as you needed to, valuable, high value work. You're constantly expanding and contracting the workload. You add high value, you subtract low value. You flow to surges. The workload is you know, always in a flow like this. You're not always cranking it out, adding work on because you'll burn everybody out. You take time to rest, recuperate, right? To, to harvest the seeds that you've planted, not to always be in planting seed mode um, and vice versa. To, then time to plant seeds and not always be in harvest mode, in and out. Now, whether or not you agree with that definition, it's not important. In fact, I kind of hope you don't agree with that definition because the real power here is to use the grid with your boss or with your employee to go through metric by metric and spell out the difference in the definitions. It forces you to be clear on the difference between good and great. Research shows us that when we set expectations with our employees, in over 85% of the cases, the language we use is too general. It's open to interpretation. And, and oftentimes, therefore, the employee walks away not really knowing what the expectations are or how to over-deliver on those expectations and deliver great. And when you force yourself to define good and great, it changes that. It changes everything on the expectations front. Oh, by the way, here's another bonus of it. It helps you create individual learning and growth plans for each employee. For example, let's say we did the exercise where, you know, you were my employee, right? And we defined what good leadership was and what great leadership was. You might say, ah, I get it, boss. Now I know what you mean by great leadership. I know that's what you're expecting to get to greatness. Now that I understand that, I see like, you know, I'm going to need some training. You know, part of what you think is great is that you have to, and I'm making this up, you have to be a great public speaker. Okay, well, I need coaching on public speaking and so on. Boom, just like that, you have individualized learning and growth plan, plans. Very powerful tip for leading up in the organization. Now, when you lead from the middle, you have to lead up. You also have to lead down in the organization. And what I mean by that is you have to coach, train, teach, direct, your direct employees, people who report to you formally in an organizational structure. And again, even if you don't have employees reporting to you yet, everything I'm talking about in this webinar is going to help prepare you for the day that you do and that you will so that you'll be the best middle manager that you can be. So here's a power tip for leading down in the organization to your employees. And I want to focus on feedback because this is really, I chose this one out of all the tips I have in leading from the middle of the book, because this is, it's, it's by popular request. The most common question that I get from middle managers that want to be successful and continue to accelerate is how do I give really good feedback? So I want to share with you some very powerful things. There are what coaching science has shown us over and over again. There are six things that are the most important fundamentals of feedback. I could cover more. I'm just going to cover six very quickly for you. When you're giving feedback to an employee, it's so important, first of all, that you're specific. My grandpa used to say, you know, white bread ain't nutritious. That bland, generic, you know, white bread is good for nobody. Think of feedback that way, right? You can't give bland, generic feedback. It has to be not white bread, but wheat bread filled with grains, granular, specific, so that it's wholesome for everybody. You got to be specific. You got to be sincere. If it comes from the heart, 
it sticks in the mind. Whether you're giving praise and you really want them to see like it's coming from a genuine place or you're pushing on them to improve, you want them to come from a sincere place of empathy and that you want to help them grow. Another tip, really important for giving great feedback, once in a career feedback to employees, you're remembered for giving feedback to employees, is to be calibrating as well. This means give context. You can't just give employees feedback and then let it sit there without giving them context, especially if it's corrective feedback, because what will they do? They'll spiral, they'll assume the worst with it and they'll spiral downwards. So you got to give them context. For example, you know, let's say, you know, you work for me, I give you feedback on, um, and I'm making this up, boy, you really got to start, you know, coming to meetings on time more often. Then I have to kind of put that in context. Now, at this point in your development, you're just getting started in the role and you're still figuring out where to be, what to do. And it's understandable if you're late to some meetings and that's okay at this point in your development. Or it might be something like this. Hey, you're late to meetings all the time. And you know what, at this stage in your development, you're senior enough, you know the importance of being on time to every meeting. Like if you don't fix this, it's going to affect your ability to get promoted, right? You put it in proper context. You have to calibrate the nature of the feedback, whether it's positive feedback, by the way, or corrective feedback. If you give positive feedback, you don't want them to take it and say, oh, I see what you're saying. I'm definitely going to get promoted, right? You, you want to put the, the proper context around it so that they don't misconstrue anything from the positive or constructive feedback that you're giving. The next rule is to be commensurate right? And this means don't, don't overstate or understate what you're praising or pushing on. Slightly related to the point I just made, right? Which is, if you're going to give praise, give it at the level that it's warranted so that they don't, so that it's not overblown. It doesn't feel right, you know? Then at the same time, don't undersell it either. If it's something that they did that's really good, let them know how proud you are of them, what it meant to the company. Don't undersell it. And on the other side of the coin, same thing. If you're giving corrective feedback to help them improve, don't overstate it, making it feel like the sky is going to fall. And don't understate it if, if the mistakes they made and what they need to work on is really a big deal. Don't understate it. Be commensurate. And also remember that people generally, they, they do more good things than bad. And you should keep that in mind in the ratio that you give feedback. Research now shows us that the proper ratio for positive feedback to corrective feedback is five to one. For every five piece, or I should reverse this, for every one piece of corrective feedback that you give, you should give five pieces of positive feedback. Research shows us that's right about right of where we get comfortable with feedback and we feel better about that when we receive corrective feedback. We're more receptive of it when the ratio is five to one. You got to be timely when you're giving feedback. After the fact feedback is matter of fact feedback. And finally, you got to be tailored, right? You have to give people feedback the way that they want to receive it. You know, I'm convinced there's three kinds of people in this world. You know, there's the first kind of people in this world. They're the type that wants to, you know, they want to receive the negative feedback right up front before you get to the good stuff, right? That's me, right? Tell me the negative feedback. What do I need to work on, right? So, because I wouldn't even be able to enjoy the good stuff after that if you don't tell me that, right? Person number one. Person number two, they want the compliment sandwich when it comes to feedback. Tell me something wonderful about me and what I'm doing. Give me the corrective feedback and then sandwich it with something else that's wonderful, right? Then the third kind of person is the person who says they want the first thing, but they really want the second thing. They really want the compliment sandwich. How do you know? You ask. You find out how people like to receive feedback. Those are the half dozen key points to giving feedback. Now, I can't leave this topic without at least giving you a quick run through of the most common other feedback mistakes. So, so in other words, besides not doing this, besides the mistake of not doing these things, what are the other most common feedback mistakes that we make? I'm going to bunch these together and move through these quickly. We, a big mistake we make is we bring others in, you know, meaning, oh, hey, uh, Jack, you know, I, I saw that uh, you're not doing so well on this front, you know, because uh, Susie told me that you weren't doing so well. No, 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 no. This is about you and your observations. That's fine if you talk to other people to get to that observation, but it's your reflections and observations. You know, that's an easy out to say, hey, let me tell you what someone else said about you, right? Lack of bravery is a problem. Just not being honest with the person about what they need to develop on it. And you owe that. You owe them that clarity. You would want it, right? To be able to improve. A couple other big mistakes we make. Guessing at motives, right? Well, um, John, I, you know, I know you didn't turn in this report on time. 
because you're lazy. And that's the feedback I'm giving you is that you're lazy. Now you can't assume the motive was that they didn't care about it and that they were lazy and they didn't do it. You have to dig in and find out what the motive was afterwards, but you can't guess at what it was, right? Backtracking is another mistake. I used to do this all the time as an early manager, right? Where you're going through um, a, you know, feedback and you give them, okay, hey, listen, this is the thing I need you to work on. And maybe it's an uncomfortable discussion, right? No one loves to give you know, corrective negative feedback, right? So then what would I do? Towards the end of it, I'd want the, the feedback session to end positive and warm and fuzzy. So I'd start to backtrack. But you know, I, I know we talked about you need to work on this thing, but you're doing a great job overall. I really appreciate you having here. Don't worry about that thing we talked about. You know, I know you'll get there, right? And then you end up confusing the employee. And they're like, wait a minute, wait. So I need to work on that thing? I'm doing great or I'm not? Be careful not to backtrack. Stay firm if it's a, if it's a corrective feedback session. Uh, you can't make it all about the individual versus the action, right? This is where you let things personal get in the way and, and the person just aggravates you and your feedback is about that person's personality, not about the action or the behavior they need to change. A couple other common mistakes, sugarcoating, right? You gotta just get right to the point, not being prepared for feedback. You ever been in a session with a boss who's kind of winging it? When they're giving you feedback, you can tell, like that doesn't feel good at all, right? You feel like they don't care. They didn't put it, they didn't, they didn't have the time to put enough effort in to give you accurate, well thought through feedback. It leaves a terrible impression. And then the last couple is right, you know, you never want to have the wrong setting, especially if you're going to give corrective feedback. You know, you want to do that in private. And you don't want to give praise in public if the person doesn't want to receive it that way. How do you find out? You ask, right? Never make feedback one way. It's always two ways, right? I, I used to, at least every other feedback session that I was working with an employee, I'd say, okay, now, by the way, don't forget, you have the right to give me feedback too to improve or to tell me what I'm doing, right? And then failing to document is the last mistake. No one likes to document, uh, you know, employees that aren't delivering. And if you ever get to that point where you have to usher the employee out of the organization, you really want to make sure you're documenting what you've talked about in your feedback sessions along the way. So, so that's a, a dip into managing down. Now I want to give you one power tip to close this out in the webinar for managing across. Now, what I mean by this is, you know, as a middle manager, you don't always have influence and authority formally over people. You have to influence people over whom you have no formal authority all the time. They're called peers and teammates sometimes that don't report to you. So how do you, how do you influence them? Well, I want to share with something, you know, something with you that I call the golden rule of influence. And I picked it up from something that, that I saw that um, author Dan Schwartz wrote. And I thought it was exactly spot on. And, I, and I've taken it and labeled it the, the golden rule of influence because I believe that's exactly what it is. And here's what it says. Let's do a little test. I want you to think right now of somebody in your life that had tremendous influence over you. Uh, and let's, let's just focus on work for a minute, let's say, right? They had tremendous influence on you at work, but you didn't formally report to them at all. They had no formal authority over you. Why were they so influential to you at work? And let's expand it. Even in life, someone even in life that has clearly has no formal authority over you. Why were they so influential on you? Well, the odds are they did one of four things. They took the time to care, listen, give, or teach. Guarantee you one of those four things, maybe all of them or a mixture of some of them, is why that person in your life who has no formal authority over you was still so influential. So the golden rule, as I've labeled it, says, if you want to be just as influential, do the same thing. For peers and teammates, show that you care. Listen, give, give of your time, give of your knowledge, give of your expertise, and teach and you will have tremendous influence across the organization. This has been about getting influence up, down, and across the organization. To wrap it up, here's what we covered. I want you to take pride in your role in the middle. Take pride, mentally reframe in the ways that we talked about. We talked about some best practices. The 50-50 rule, how you should always ask yourself the golden question, am I assisting success or avoiding failure? How can I invest in information sharing it's a, as a priority? And finally, I, you know, to manage up, down, and across with brilliance, just a few power tips, you know, get clear on expectations with your boss to, to influence up, give great feedback to influence down and, and, and lead folks down and to influence across, remember the golden rule of influence. Now, you're going to get a chance to work on this a lot more, so much more 
is packed into my book, Leading from the Middle. As I said, I'm you know, just very proud to say it's already an Amazon number one best-selling new release. And I believe that's because it's an unmet need. There aren't many books at all written, like, like a love letter that I've written to this audience in the middle. I've cracked a code on the unique challenges that middle managers face and what they, the skill set and mindset required to influence up, down, and across the organization. If you want to check out the book, you can just go to Amazon by title and by my name, Scott Mounts, or you can go to scottmounts.com to find the book leading from the middle as there, you know, there as well. And I put together some, some extra bonuses for you. So besides just searching for the book on Amazon or finding it on scottmounts.com, I wanted to put together some more bonuses for you. And if you text this number, 44222, if, uh, if you're based in the United States, you text 44222, all in caps, middle dash tools, no spaces in between that. You'll get the key slides from this webinar. Plus, you'll get a workbook that accompanies leading from the middle with over 30 pages of questions. And research shows that some people like to fill in the blanks and answer multiple questions to help them learn content. You'll get that free workbook. You'll get cheat sheets that go along with leading from the middle, printable cheat sheets that have some of the tools, the most important tools in the book that you could print out and keep at your desk. And even a discussion guide if you want to engage in a group discussion about the book with, with other folks. So 44222 text middle dash tools. If you're not based in the United States, you can always just email me at scott at scottmouts.com and ask me for this set of tools and I can, I can send you them as well. So just remember, if you want to lead from the middle with power and with vigor, check out my book, Leading from the Middle. Go to Amazon by my title, my name, Scott, Bout, Scott Mouts, or go to scottmouts.com. Thank you so much today, folks. I hope you found this of value and had as much fun listening as I had sharing with you today.